فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد بإذن الله الكريم today we're going to be starting the explanation of the book um, الأجرمية Ajrumiya is a grammar book. Um, I will speak a bit about the author in a very summarized, abridged manner. But the explanation that we're going to be relying on, that we're going to make it our umda, is Tuhfatu Saniya, written by Muhammad Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid. This is the sharah and the explanation we're going to rely on. It's called a Tuhfatu Saniya. بشرح المقدمة الآجرومية and it is written by محمد محيدين عبد الحميد that's the sharah that we're going to use as you can all see we have a board here so I'm going to be standing up sometimes when I feel that there is a need for us to uh, explain things on the board if I need to go up and stand up and, and, and mention points I will be إذن الله الكريم um, and I'll try my best, inshaAllah ta'ala, to make my writing as clear as possible bi idhnillahi kareem. As you all know, and you're all aware of, um, any field that you study, the scholars, they say that there are po 10 points that you have to know. They refer to this as the mabadi'ul ashara, which is basically, um, it's like a muqaddimah, it's an introduction, an overview of that particular field that you're going to study. So what we need to do is, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions before we go into nahu, grammar. Such as, what's the meaning of grammar? What does nahu actually mean? Uh, what? So the first one I hear I wrote is ta'rifu, what's its definition? Also, mawdu'uhu, what does it... Um, Tackle, what's, what's the topics that are in it? Okay, Thamaratu, what's the benefits of us studying this? What benefit do we gain from studying grammar? Because there's no point in studying something if you're not going to get a benefit from it. Nisbatuhu, Nisbatuhu here means where does it lie in other sciences? Wadi'uhu, um, who's the person who placed and laid down this science? Grammar. What's the ruling of studying grammar? It is, is it obligatory? Is it recommended? What is the ruling of studying grammar? And the scholars, they summarize that all in a line of two, three lines of poetry. They say, so they, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to be idhni lahi kareem, go to the first one, which is the definition of the word. Nahu. Have you guys heard that word before? Nahu. So in Arabic they call it Nahu. What's the definition of the word Nahu? In the Arabic language, in the lexical meaning, in the linguistic meaning, the word Nahu has many meanings. One of its meanings is Al Jiha, direction. Jiha. For example, you will say, The Hab to I went, Nahwa Fulanin, in the direction of so and so. So what do you say? You say to I went I went to the direction of so and so. Direction. That direction. That's one meaning that it has in the lexical meaning. The second meaning that it has is a ship. A ship who will 
when something resembles something and it looks like something. For example, you will say Muhammadun Nahu Ali. Muhammad is like Ali. He's like him. He resembles him. So those are the meanings that it means in the language. Now we've understood what, gra what the word and nahu. So if I asked you now, what does nahu mean? You would say to me, two meanings that we've taken. What was the first meaning that we took? It means al jiha direction. The second meaning that we said it has is called what? What's the second meaning that we, that we said it has? al shibhu wal mithlu. Well, something resembles something and looks like it. Good. So those are the two. Now we're going to go into what does it mean according to the grammarians. The people of this field of grammar, when they use the word an-nahu, what is it that they mean? And what's their usage of this word? The ulama of grammar, the scholars of grammar, when they use the word nahu, they mean by it Al-ilmu bil qawa'idi Al-lati yu'rafu biha Ahkamu awakhiri al-kalimati al-arabiyyati Fi hali tarkibiha Min al-i'rabi wal-binai Wa ma yatba'u dhalika It's principles That the, the science is what? It's al-qawa'id Through those principles So it's principles and within those principles that you're learning and that you're attaining, you're learning the rulings of the ending of the word in the Arabic language when it's put into a context. Such as when it's mu'rab, when it's mebni, and anything that follows that. That's what grammar means. That's what nahu means according to the grammarians. So it's principles. And through those principles, you're learning the rulings of the ending of the word. Which words? The Arabic words. When? When they're put in a context. So for example, my brothers and sisters, are we together? So are you learning principles? Qawa'id principles you're going to memorize, inshaAllah ta'ala. The principle, for example, is Al-fa'ilu marfu'un. Fa'il is marfu'un, it's a qa'idah. You need to memorize that. Sah? Al-Maf'ulu Al-Maf'ulu bihi is mansoob It's a qa'idah, you memorize that Good These principles that you're learning These qawa'id that you're learning is when? It's the ruling of the ending of the wording Ahkamu awakhiri al-kalimat al-arabiyah You're learning the ending of the wording In other words, grammar does not deal with the middle of the word Sah? So, it doesn't deal with the middle of the word. So the word Zayd, Zayyadan, Zayd. Zayd, the, uh, the grammarians don't look at the Ya and they don't look at the Z. That's not their focus point. What they focus on is the Dal, Zayd, the Dal, at the ending. Huh? The sign that's on it. That's their focus point. Good. When though? When Zayd is by itself somewhere and it's not in a context? No. They only speak about the word when it is what? Fi hali tarkibiha, when it's in a context, when it's in a sentence, when it's in a context. There's something before it and there is something after it. Huh? Pay attention to that. Because Zayd, what just happened to the Dal right now? Zayd, what just happened? It's Waqf, I've stopped, I can't say anything after that. So because it's Waqf, you haven't placed a, a sign on the ending of the word Zayd. Because not. But if I say Ja'a Zaydun, I have to say now. Are we all together? The minute I put the word Ja'a, Zayd came, now you've put it into a sentence. Now the grammarians will come and they will intervene. They would want to know, okay, mm -hmm. what's Zayd's? What's Zayd's uh, uh, ruling right now? 
What's the ruling of Zayd right now? Are we together? Pay attention. And then he gives you uh, the, the map from I'rab. When it's in I'rab, the signs that it has, it, it, the signs that it has, and bina when it's mebni, the grammarians they deal with those two, I'rab and bina. Now you don't know what they mean. You shouldn't busy yourself to find out what they mean, because we're going to come to what I'rab means and we're going to come to what bina means. Good. So that's the definition of uh, nahu. We've defined what nahu means. We're now going to move on to the next part, which is al mawdu. Okay, Mawdu here means what does this topic deal with? Grammar Nahu it deals with Al Kalimatul Arabiyah. It deals with the Arabic words. It doesn't deal with English. It doesn't deal with French. It doesn't deal with Urdu. It doesn't deal with Somali. It deals with the Arabic words. That's what it does. That's the that's the underlining thing that it discusses all day. All day you're studying Kalimatul Arabiya, the Arabic words. And you're researching that. And you're researching its situation. And its ins and its outs. That's what you're learning. The next point that we're looking at, which is Mubur. Then the second one is, the third one is Athamara. Athamara means what? The benefits and the outcome. And this is something I really have to, I really have to shun some light on, which is, if you're studying a science, and that science that you're studying, and that you're learning, you're not getting from it, and you're not attaining from that science any benefits, then it's a waste of time. And it is not a science that's pleasing to Allah. Any science, that does not bring about any benefit for you. It's not a knowledge in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with. And Ibn Rajab mentions that in his kitab, Fadl ilm al salafi ala ilm al khalaf. And Imam al Shafi'i said, I looked at all of knowledge. And Imam al Shafi'i said this. Shafi'i said, I looked at all of knowledge. I've observed each one. Not that he's saying he studied all of it, but he looked at every science there is out there. And he said, I realize that two sciences are the best. Tibbu al Abdani. Medicine. And the second one is the Tib of the Nafs. The spiritual and the physical medicine. Tibbu al Abdani, the one he means by the physical. He means the actual medicine that people study. And the second one is Tibbu Nafs means what? Al Kitab wa Sunnah wa bima alayhi salaf al Ummah. The Quran and the Sunnah, that which the pious predecessors were upon. And he said, I looked at both of them again. And he said, I realized that the Tibbu Nafs is better than even the Tibbu Al Abdan because the benefits of this world and the hereafter are connected to this. So after the Sharia, what's the best science? After we leave the Sharia and the knowledge of the Sharia, we'll say medicine is the best knowledge. Medicine is the best that a person studies. So there has to be a benefit in a science that you're learning. Sometimes you see a sister going to university, she's taking student loan and she's learning what? Art. Or a brother, he's learning art in university. Really? So some people are learning things that are very, very, very pathetic. They go to uni and they're learning what? Drama. For three years, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to, pick to, you're going to be taking this amount of money. You're going to riba. All of this for what? Huh? So the science and the knowledge which you're learning has to have tamara. Tamara means fruit, the outcome that you need to attain from it. It's important. That's why the ulama always talk about before you study a subject they have to, to entice you, to allow you to come into that science properly, they'll tell you the tamara and the benefits that are in it. What's the benefit in studying uh, grammar? The benefit is صِيَانَةُ lisani عَنِ الْخَطَأِ فِي الْكَلَامِ الْعَرَبِي You protect your tongue from the mistakes that may occur from somebody whilst they are trying to speak in the Arabic language. 
you will not say mistakes and incorrect statements in the Arabic language. Once you study grammar, your speech inshallah ta'ala will be, will be correct. You will know when to place a fatha, and a kasra, and a dhamma. You will know. So you won't get it wrong. And this is very important because the Quran is in what language? It's in the Arabic language. And the Quran goes according to the Arabic grammar. The Quran goes in accordance to the what? The Arabic? It goes in accordance to the Arabic grammar. So if a person doesn't know the Arabic grammar and has no knowledge or understanding of it, he will most likely read the Quran incorrectly. Umar anhu, he prohibited from those who don't know the language properly and are not good in the grammar, he prohibited them from what? From teaching the Quran or even leading the people. Umar prohibited them from it. Because there's ayat in the Quran that the signs have been changed and the meaning will change with it. For example, if you get wrong, if you say you're now saying Allah fears this list. Allah fears he the scholars where it should have been what the scholars are the ones who are most fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but just by changing a fatha to a dhamma you've changed the whole meaning of the verse and you've given it a whole different meaning. And that mistake here is actually a mistake that has changed the meaning into a severe meaning. A very problematic, aqadi, aqidah related problem. That you've now given the attributes of the creation to the creator. And you've given the attributes of the creation to the creator. Are you with me brothers? And this is, so it's important. And also, the ulama mentioned, even Zainuddin al-Iraqi, he brings it in his Alfiya, and many have also brought it in their books of Mustalah al-Hadith, the science of Hadith, that the person who reads the Quran, Hadith of the Prophet and he reads it wrong, because he grammatically doesn't know the Arabic language very well. So he reads the Arabic. Uh, of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and he, plays, he mess, messes up the kasr, the fatha, the dhamma, he messes it all up. This person will fall under the hadith of the Prophet. Anyone who lies about me deliberately, let him prepare his place in the hellfire. He will fall under that hadith. That person will fall under that hadith. Which person? The one who read a hadith grammatically wrong. Why? Why would he fall under that hadith? The reason why he will fall under that hadith is because what you're saying is that the Prophet was ignorant in the grammar just like how I am and that the Prophet said it just like how I am saying it and you're saying about him that which he didn't say the Prophet didn't do the kasr and the fatha mistakes like this so it's very dangerous very very dangerous so a person needs to learn the Arabic grammar وفهم القرآن الكريم والحديث النبوي صح فهم صحيحة. Also understanding the Quran and also understanding the prophetic tradition, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you want to understand it properly, you will need to know grammar. You will need to. And these are what brothers, the Quran and the Sunnah are what to us. اللذين هما أصل الشريعة الإسلامية وعليهما مدارها. And the whole religion revolves around the Kitab and the Sunnah. And they are both in the Arabic language. And I say this to the brothers all the time, and I say it to those who I see. Arabic language is not the language of the Arabs. It's the language of every Muslim. When somebody asks you and says to you, what's your first language? Your first language is Arabic. Because the Arabic language is what the Quran came down. The Arabic language has become the language of every Muslim, wherever he is from the world. You need to understand that. Now we're going to move on to the next one, which is 
نسبته 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 هي is what where does this science fall grammar where would you find it grammar is it falls under علوم العربية it falls under one of the 12 sciences that are studied in the Arabic language the Arabic language when you want to study it there are 12 sciences that you have to study to learn the Arabic language one of the 12 is Arabic grammar there's morphology there's Arabic literature there is you know poetry there is uh, uh, so there's uh, the, the, there's balagha eloquency which is categorized into three ilm al bayan ilm al badi ilm al maani there's urud al qawafi huh? there is uh, sarf there is adab adab lugha all of these are one of the 12 sciences of the arabic language and grammar is one of them that's where it falls into that's the chapter that you will throw grammar in al ulum al arabiyya so it will fall under the heading of what? The Arabic sciences. The Arabic sciences. Ulum al Arabiya, grammar will fall under there. There are 12 sciences, and grammar is one of them. Rather, the Arabic grammar is the greatest and the highest ranked in Ulum al Arabiya. It's the highest ranked. From those 12 sciences that fall under the science of Arabic, the greatest of them and the highest of them is which one? Uh, Nahu, grammar is. You need to know that. Now we're going to move on to the Wadi'uhu. Wadi'uhu means who is a person who placed this science, who put this science together. Okay? What is famous and well known that the first person who put this science, grammar, together is none other than Abu Aswad al-Du'ali Abu Aswad al-Du'ali rahimahullah and they say he did this with the command of who? Ali ibn Abi Talib that Ali ibn Abi Talib commanded him specifically to write grammar when Ali saw that the people were doing mistakes he told him not he told him to write grammar now pay attention here because this is very important information here the name of the wording Nahu, it's, it was said that it came even from Ali ibn Abi Talib. The word of Nahu, grammar. That word, Nahu, Nahu. They said he was the one who used that wording. How did he use it? What he did was, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he told Abu Aswad al duali Ali told Abu Aswad al duali he said, write that the speech is categorized into three. Ism, Fi'il, Harf. said, write that it's categorized into these three. And then when he showed him the way to start and gave him an idea, Ali said to him after that, and tread on that path. Meaning, one ala هذا النحو. Ala هذا النحو means, go towards that direction. So he used that word for him, nahu. And that term got taken from Ali's mouth and it became, it became the, uh, it became the uh, name for this particular science. We're going to mention the last type of the Mabadi al-Ashara, which is Hukm al-Shari'i fihi. What's the ruling of studying grammar? Is it obligatory? Is it voluntary? Is it disliked? Is it haram? Um, the ruling in studying grammar is that it is that it is a communal obligation it's a communal ob obligation communal obligation means that within the community there have to be a people who study it so when there's two types of obligation right there's that individual obligation and there's that communal obligation the individual obligation means that every single individual has to do it independently and they have to do it you need to pray dhuhr you need to pray asr you need to pray maghrib you need to pray isha and you need to pray fajr no one can pray for you but salatul janazah on the other hand 
is a communal obligation, meaning as long as there is a group of people who are praying, you don't have to pray. But if everybody leaves praying Salatul Janazah, you're all sinners. Are we all together? So grammar is a communal obligation. It's a what? Huh? It's a communal obligation. Meaning there has to be a group of people who study it. We've now finished the Mabadi uh, al-Ashara, some, some of them we've mentioned. We've mentioned six that we wanted to know from it. Who is the author of this particular book? This kitab that we have, which is uh, Al-Ajrubiya, that we always talk about and you see it on billboards and everyone's promoting and it's being pushed. Who is the author of this book? The author of this book and the Musannif is Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Muhammad Ibn Dawood as His name is again Abu Abdullah. That's his kunya. His name is Muhammad and his father's name is Muhammad. His granddad's name is Dawood. And he is from the lineage as Sinhaji. And he's very well known as Bibnu Ajurum. He's very well known as Bibn Ajurum. Ajurum is what he, the, the Ibn Ajurum is what he's known very well as. He was born when the year was Ithnataini was Sabina. Was 672. 672. And he died 723 he died. He died 723. The scholars they say much, not much is known about him. Not much is known about him. He was a very. Uh, he's from those scholars we can say, whose biography is unknown. There are many scholars like that, whose books and their works have become maqbul ladanas, accepted by the people. But they, the authors, are not known. And this is the thamaratul ikhlas, sincerity that they truly just wanted the people to benefit from the knowledge and the khayr. They didn't really want anything to be attributed to them. And they didn't want people to know who they were. It was said about Imam al-Shafi'i that he said the same. He said, I wish that the people attained and gained knowledge, but nothing was attributed to me. Nothing is attributed to me, Shafi'i. So the Salaf Hadi al-Ummah, they really, really love the idea of people benefiting and taking beneficial knowledge but this the harm that comes with it which is fame and uh, is something they didn't like so he rahimahullah and not much is known about him we're now going to start the book inshallah ta'ala the author rahimahullah he says al-kalamu huwa al Al-Murakabu Al-Mufidu bil The author started by talking about Al-Kalam. Kalam in the Arabic language is what? Speech. He says, Al-Kalamu, speech, is. The word Kalam, because we're going to go more in details this lesson, inshallah ta'ala. And as I said, I'm going to rely on a sharah by Muhammad Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid. The kalam, it has two meanings. One is a linguistic and a lexical meaning. And the second one is what? A technical meaning. 
And when we say lexical meaning, we, need, we mean according to the Arabic language. And the second one is that the word kalam has a what? It, it has a... It has a what? It has a definition according to the grammarians. So the first one is in accordance to the Arabic language. And the second one is according to the, grammar, the grammarians.